glory to Jesus Christ, Yehoshua HaMashiach, our Lord and Savior. Amen. Brothers and sisters, today we are looking at a proper burial. We are in the scriptures in Genesis chapter 23, starting at verse 1. And Sarah was 107 and 20 years old. These were the years of the life of Sarah. So Sarah lived 127 years. That was the lifespan. And thereby, brothers and sisters, we are reminded that we are not eternal in terms of our earthly pilgrimage. In James chapter 4, verse 14, Whereas ye know not what shall be on the morrow, for what is your life? It is even a vapor that appeareth for a little time, and then vanisheth away. We go to Psalm chapter 90, verse 12. So teach us to number our days, that we may apply our hearts unto wisdom. And so there is a given window of time, a window of opportunity, during which we have occasion to express the wisdom of God, and that we may apply our hearts unto this wisdom to grow therein, because there is a number to our days. Remember, in the beginning, God said that man is flesh, and therefore that his days would be limited. We can also go to Psalm chapter 39, verses 4 and 5. Lord, make me to know mine end, and the measure of my days, what it is, that I may know how frail I am. Behold, thou hast made my days as in hand breath, and mine age is as nothing before thee. Verily, every man at his best state is altogether vanity, Selah. And so, brothers and sisters, our life, but a vapor, there is a number to our days, and God accepts our works during the time of our earthly pilgrimage, and we must redeem the time. And we go back here in Genesis chapter 23, to look at Sarah and how Sarah had 127 years of life. We read again, and Sarah was 107 and 20 years old. These were the years of the life of Sarah, her earthly pilgrimage. Verse two, and Sarah died in Kirjath Arba. The same is Hebron in the land of Canaan. And Abraham came to mourn for Sarah and to weep for her. And so we are human beings in the flesh. We have emotions and we become attached to our loved ones. And here Abraham being grieved by the death of Sarah, he came to mourn for her. And so it is biblical to mourn for the dead. Although we must not go to the extent of turning them into idols and then worship ancestors. But at the time of the passing of our loved ones, it is biblical to mourn for them as Abraham came to mourn for Sarah and to weep for her. And so there is great grief in losing a loved one. We have a human nature, we have emotions. And though we must keep them in check, they still are going to manifest concerning certain traumas that we experience and losing a loved one is such a trauma. So Abraham came to mourn for Sarah and to weep for her. Now, as we all agree that Jesus Christ is our perfect example, let's look at how he dealt with death. Did he simply turn from the dead and did not consider having any emotion outpoured for them? It is not so. Let us look at Jesus, how he reacted to the news of the passing of Lazarus. We go to the Gospel of John, chapter 11, starting at verse 30. Now, Jesus was not yet come into the town, but was in that place where Martha met him. The Jews then, which were with her in the house, and comforted her, she was comforted in her grief. When they saw Mary, that she rose up hastily and went out, followed her, saying, She goeth unto the grave to weep there. 
And so there is an expectation that when we have lost a loved one, that we will mourn for them, that we will weep for them, and even take some time to perhaps seek closure by going to the gravesite. Verse 32. Then when Mary was come where Jesus was and saw him, she fell down at his feet, saying unto him, Lord, if thou hadst been here, my brother had not died. We keep hoping that our loved ones will stay with us for as long as possible. And we even can go to the extent of blaming others for actions that they have not taken. And then according to us, would make them responsible for the passing of our loved ones. It may or may not be the case. But in this instance, it was the plan of Jesus that Lazarus would pass away so that Jesus would validate the words, I am the life and the resurrection, which he spoke in John chapter 11, verse 25. And so we read again at the end of verse 32. Lord, if thou hadst been here, my brother had not died. Verse 33, when Jesus therefore saw her weeping, and the Jews also weeping which came with her, he groaned in the spirit and was troubled. And so at the mere sight of others who are grieved by the death of a loved one, we as human beings, we commune with them. We have empathy. Amen. Verse 34, and said, where have ye laid him? They said unto him, Lord, come and see. Verse 35, very powerful. Jesus wept. Jesus knew the plan concerning Lazarus to demonstrate the raising of the dead. He knew beforehand, but he was still very grieved to see the pain and the suffering in the hearts of those who loved Lazarus, including himself. He was grieved by the death of Lazarus. Verse 35, Jesus wept. And so brothers and sisters, sometimes we may try to make ourselves out to be more spiritual than we can be. Jesus himself wept for the dead. He wept for Lazarus. Verse 36, then said the Jews, behold how he loved him. And some of them said, could not this man, which opened the eyes of the blind, have caused that even this man should not have died? And so we remember how the Bible teaches us that our ways are not the ways of the Lord. They are much higher than ours. And that everything that happens, happens for a reason, even for our good. Jesus was going to demonstrate the raising of the dead for all to see. But they don't know yet what the Lord already knows, having a foreknowledge. Verse 38, Jesus therefore again groaning in himself cometh to the grave. And so Jesus shows up to the grave and he is groaning in himself. He is also weeping and mourning for the dead. We finish reading, it was a cave and a stone lay upon it. And so Lazarus died in the flesh and he was put in a sepulcher and Jesus was grieved and wept. We are talking about a proper burial. The proper burial of men and women after that their earthly pilgrimage has come to an end and the pain and the grief that comes to afflict the hearts of those who loved the departed. And so we are back in Genesis chapter 23, verse two, and Sarah died in Kirjath Harba, the same as Hebron in the land of Canaan. And Abraham came to mourn for Sarah and to weep for her. Verse three, and Abraham stood up from before his dead and spake unto the sons of Heth, saying, I am a stranger and a sojourner with you. Give me a possession of a burying place with you, that I may bury my dead out of my sight. This is a very powerful verse also. 
we see that despite the grief that we have, despite the pain and the sorrow that we have in our hearts, we ultimately come to the understanding that we have to bury our dead out of our sight. We do not want to see them anymore because there is a separation between those who are living and those who are dead. And we speak therefore of a burying place, even a burying place that you have to acquire so that you can provide a proper burial for the dead, that I may bury my dead out of my sight. And so brothers and sisters, Abraham, he experienced wonderful things with his wife, Sarah. But when the time came that she was dead, what he now had in mind was to bury her, the dead, out of his sight. And yet, while she was living, they experienced magnificent things together, certainly. But there is a time for everything. Sarah died at 127 years old. Ecclesiastes chapter 3, we start at verse 1. To everything there is a season and a time to every purpose under the heaven, a time to be born. Sarah was born and a time to die. We read in verse two that Sarah died. And so there was a time appointed for Sarah to die, a time to plant and a time to pluck up that which is planted. Verse three, a time to kill and a time to heal a time to break down and a time to build up, a time to weep and a time to laugh, a time to mourn and a time to dance. And so Abraham, he mourned for her, but there is a time for everything. And there was also a time to bury her out of his sight. And when we continue reading at verse five, a time to cast away stones and a time to gather stones together, a time to embrace and a time to refrain from embracing this precious woman in his life whom he had embraced. It was now a time to refrain from embracing, but rather to do what? Verse six, a time to get and a time to lose, a time to keep and a time to cast away. It was now time to cast away Sarah's corpse, that I may bury my dead out of my sight. Because, as we saw in Ecclesiastes chapter 3, to everything there is a season and a time to every purpose under the heaven. Brothers and sisters, let us look at some of those times in the life of Sarah. Genesis chapter 18. We start at verse 12. Therefore, Sarah laughed within herself. There was a time to laugh, saying, After I am waxed old, shall I have pleasure, my Lord being old also? And the Lord said unto Abraham, Wherefore did Sarah laugh, saying, Shall I of a shorty bear a child, which am old? Is anything too hard for the Lord? At the time appointed, I will return unto thee, according to the time of life, and Sarah shall have a son. There was a time when Sarah laughed. There was a time when Sarah was going to have a son and know the joy and exhilaration of motherhood. We now go to Genesis chapter 21. We start at verse one. And the Lord visited Sarah, as he had said, and the Lord did unto Sarah as he had spoken. For Sarah conceived and bare Abraham a son in his old age at the set time of which God had spoken to him. You see here, Sarah knowing the joy of motherhood at the appointed time. And so there was a time for Sarah's son, Isaac, to be born. And there was a time for Sarah to be born before him and a time for Sarah to eventually die, as there will be for Abraham different times, different seasons. Oh, our life is but a vapor. And so Sarah laughed at one point in her life. Sarah conceived 
at one point in her life. Verse three, and Abraham called the name of his son that was born unto him, whom Sarah bare to him, Isaac. And so Sarah laughed, Sarah conceived. Sarah was precious to the eyes of Abraham. She was his wife. First Peter chapter three, verse six, even as Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord, there was a time when Sarah reverenced Abraham and obeyed him. She was subject unto him as he had rule over her. Whose daughters ye are as long as ye do well and are not afraid with any amazement. And so there was the joy of having a husband for Sarah and conversely the joy of having a wife for Abraham. And so Abraham was blessed with Sarah, his wife. Let us go to Proverbs chapter five, starting at verse 18. Let thy fountain be blessed and rejoice with the wife of thy youth. Let her be as the loving hind and pleasant roe. Let her breasts satisfy thee at all times and be thou ravished always with her love. And why wilt thou, my son, be ravished with a strange woman and embrace the bosom of a stranger. Proverbs chapter 31, verse 10. Who can find a virtuous woman? For her price is far above rubies. The heart of her husband doth safely trust in her so that he shall have no need of spoil. She will do him good and not evil all the days of her life. Do you see how there is a measure of time here during which she will do him good all the days of her life? And so Sarah, who lived 127 years old, who knew the joy of having a husband, who at one point in her life laughed, who at one point in her life knew the joy of motherhood and bare Isaac to Abraham. Sarah died at the age of 127 years old. And despite the fact that she was precious in the eyes of Abraham, she passed away. And although it is not written, this is my own assumption, I take it that Sarah, in the eyes of Abraham, she was the desire of his eyes, as it was the case for Ezekiel's wife, for the eyes of Ezekiel. So we go to Ezekiel chapter 24, starting at verse 15. Also the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Son of man, behold, I take away from thee the desire of thine eyes with a stroke. Yet neither shalt thou mourn nor weep, neither shalt thy tears run down. And so this is interesting here because God is going to give a clear commandment to Ezekiel not to mourn and weep. But I'm going to speak about that later to show you that the general principle is that we do weep for our loved ones when they depart and we do mourn for them. But there is one case of an exception and we will discuss that later. But the point that I'm making here is that I'm assuming that very likely Sarah was the desire of the eyes of Abraham, much like it was the case for Ezekiel's wife in the eyes of Ezekiel. And on top of that, Abraham had been at Sarah's side at the different seasons in her life when she laughed, when she conceived, when she was being a good wife to him, one who reverenced her husband, calling him Lord, and did him good all the days of her life. But my friends, there came a time appointed when Sarah died, because there is also a time to die. And we go back to Genesis chapter 23, at verse 3. And Abraham stood up from before his dead, and spake unto the sons of Heth, saying, so he stood up from before his dead, meaning he had probably put himself in a position close to the ground to weep and mourn the dead. 
But after a time, he stood up from before his dead and he spake unto the sons of Heth saying, I am a stranger and a sojourner with you. Give me a possession of a burying place with you. So now the focus has changed. It is about a burying place. Why? That I may bury my dead out of my sight. Notice here, he doesn't refer to her as his wife, but as his dead. And despite everything that they experienced together while she was living, now she has become the dead and she must be buried out of his sight. This is an extremely powerful verse that struck me. How we want to put the dead away, but not only put them away, but out of our sight that we see them no more. And this, despite all the joy that we had with them when they were among us during their earthly pilgrimage. Because, brothers and sisters, we must also remember that the dead are with the dead and the living with the living. In the Gospel of Mark, chapter 5, you remember about this man possessed by a legion of demons. It's interesting to see that this man, not being in his right mind, actually was making his abode, his place of residence among the dead in the tombs. Mark chapter five, verse one. And they came over unto the other side of the sea into the country of the Gadarenes. Verse two. And when he was come out of the ship, immediately there met him out of the tombs, a man with an unclean spirit. And if we go to verse 3, who had his dwelling among the tombs, and no man could bind him, no, not with chains. His dwelling was among the tombs. In other words, he dwelled among the dead. Whereas we see with Abraham that it is the opposite. He wants to bury his dead out of his sight, and we want nothing to do with the dead. Lazarus had been put in a sepulcher, and Abraham is looking to do the same with his wife, whom he is no longer calling his wife, but the dead. He wants to put her in a sepulcher as well. That I may bury my dead out of my sight. Because once we are dead, we are no longer involved with the things that are going on under the sun. We turn to Ecclesiastes chapter 9. We start at verse 3. This is an evil among all things that are done under the sun, that there is one event unto all. Yea, also the heart of the sons of man is full of evil, and madness is in their heart while they live. And after that, they go to the dead. Verse 4, For to him that is joined to all the living there is hope, for a living dog is better than a dead lion. We see here, the precious aspect of life. While there is life, there is hope. And so, as long as Sarah was alive, she was going to be a blessing to her husband, according to everything that we have read prior. But at the time that she passed away, she went from being a wife to being the dead. A living dog is better than a dead lion. The earthly glory that we have, once we pass away, it goes up in a smoke because, again, our life is but a vapor. And so the dog used in the scriptures to say that the dog returns back to his vomit, a dog that can be associated with filth, it is in a better standing here for cause of it being living than a lion in all his glory because the latter be dead. Verse five, for the living know that they shall die, but the dead know not anything, neither have they any more a reward, for the memory of them is forgotten, that I may bury my dead out of my sight. Albeit she was my wife. Verse six, also their love and their hatred and their envy is now perished. 
the good wife that Sarah was, the moments where she laughed, the moments where she conceived, the moments where she reverenced Abraham, the moments where she gave him advice and was concerned and told him to go unto the servant Hagar, their envy, everything is perished. Neither have they any more a portion forever in anything that is done under the sun. And so this verse six here is very powerful and it lets you know the extent to which a dead person is now out of the earthly pilgrimage, out of the earthly realm. They are no longer a part of it. And in a very definitive manner, neither have they any more a portion forever in anything that is done under the sun that I may bury my dead out of my sight. Verse seven, go thy way, eat thy bread with joy and drink thy wine with a merry heart. For God now accepteth thy works. There is a period of time during which God accepteth your works. For Sarah, she had 127 years and then she died. God accepted her works during that lifespan, that vapor of her life that went up in smoke, but then she died and Abraham sought to bury his dead out of his sight and sought a burying place for her. Verse eight, let thy garments be always white and let thy head like no ointment. Live joyfully with the wife whom thou lovest all the days of the life of thy vanity, which he hath given thee under the sun all the days of thy vanity. For that is thy portion in this life and in thy labor which thou takest under the sun. There is a limited time that we have under the sun and then we are taken out from beneath the sun. Verse 10, whatsoever thy hand findeth to do, do it with thy might. For there is no work, nor device, nor knowledge, nor wisdom in the grave whither thou goest. And so Sarah was a good wife, a loving wife, and she reverenced her husband and did him good all the days of her life. But when she died, and it was time to find a burying place so that she could go in the grave where she was going, she was going to be buried out of his sight and no longer in a position to do works for God to accept her works as the works of a virtuous woman. Hallelujah. And so the dead, they go away and we no longer see their face. Remember Exodus chapter 10, verse 28, and Pharaoh said unto him, that is Moses, get thee from me, take heed to thyself, see my face no more. For in that day thou seest my face, thou shalt die. And then Moses told him that he had spoken well and that he was not going to see his face anymore. And I'm just using this passage because it came to my mind to show how when someone has passed, you see their face indeed no more because they're out of sight. And so here Moses was speaking prophetically in letting Pharaoh know that indeed he was no longer going to see his face. And so prophetically, that meant that Pharaoh was going to die. And so I'm going to add verse 29 here. And Moses said, thou hast spoken well. I will see thy face again no more. And so getting back to the case of Abraham and Sarah, Abraham is looking to put Sarah away after having had a good life with her. Because when the wife is now the dead, she has become a corpse. And it is not something that is comely. Dust thou art, and unto dust shalt thou return. We know that verse from Genesis. 
And so in John chapter 11, verse 39, we read, still talking about Lazarus here, Jesus said, take ye away the stone. Martha, the sister of him that was dead, saith unto him, Lord, by this time he stinketh, for he hath been dead four days. Do you see now the change of attitude of Martha concerning her brother Lazarus? Not too long ago, everybody was very sad and grieved and was mourning and weeping for Lazarus, even wishing that he were still among them. But when the thought of him now being dead comes to mind once more, yet again, now do they remember that his body is in a state where it should be put out of their sight and buried. And so the language has changed here. Lord, by this time he stinketh, for he hath been dead four days. Yet Jesus is trying to get them to take away the stone. But we don't want him anymore, Lord. Now he is dead. I am no longer calling him my brother, but the dead. He hath been dead four days. But, brothers and sisters, in seeing how the dead are treated, we must not forget, nonetheless, that the Lord has a perspective whereby it is an honorable thing for the dead to have a proper burial. Ecclesiastes chapter 6, verse 3. If a man beget an hundred children, and live many years, so that the days of his years be many, and his soul be not filled with good, and also that he have no burial, I say that an untimely birth is better than he. And therefore we understand that to not have a burial is something that is akin to something that is lacking and that you should have deserved and not obtained. If you have no burial, an untimely birth is better than that man who did not have the burial. And so a proper burial is one of the elements that is fulfilling and proper for a man to receive. Because though he would have a lot of children and live a long life, if his soul is not filled with good, and if he have no burial, then an untimely birth is better than he. And so a proper burial is in order. And I say this so that we do not come to understand that the fact that we seek to put the dead away and out of our sight, it is not because we are trying to dishonor them, but rather simply because we understand that the time has changed, the season has changed, it is now a different season, and she who was a wife is now dead. And so we recognize that separation that is now operating because this person doesn't anymore, any longer have works to do under the sun and they've been taken away from beneath the sun and they must be put in a sepulcher. They must be buried separate from the living. Those who are still involved and engaged in the earthly pilgrimage. But as we put the dead away, we must give them a proper burial. And so this is what we understand from Ecclesiastes chapter 6, verse 3. And so to confirm this, if we look at 1 Kings chapter 21, verse 23, And of Jezebel also spake the Lord, saying, The dogs shall eat Jezebel by the wall of Jezreel. Let us read about this a story in 2 Kings chapter 9, starting at verse 30. And when Jehu was come to Jezreel, Jezebel heard of it, and she painted her face and tired her head and looked out at a window. Verse 31, and as Jehu entered in at the gate, she said, had Zimri peace who slew his master? And he lifted up his face to the window and said, who is on my side? Who? And there looked out to him two or three eunuchs. And he said, throw her down. So they threw her down. And some of her blood was sprinkled on the wall and on the horses. And he trod her underfoot. Verse 34. And when he was come in, he did eat and drink and said, go, see now this cursed woman. 
and bury her, for she is a king's daughter. You see here how Jezebel, despite the curse that was upon her, that she should perish and dogs would eat her body, yet her remains were going to be buried because being a king's daughter, there was a certain honor that still was going to be granted to her. Verse 35, and they went to bury her, but they found no more of her than the skull and the feet and the palms of her hands. And so in that she was cursed because her body was torn apart and consumed in part. Verse 36, wherefore they came again and told him, and he said, this is the word of the Lord, which he spake by his servant Elijah the Tishbite, saying, in the portion of Jezreel shall dogs eat the flesh of Jezebel, and the carcass of Jezebel shall be as dung upon the face of the field in the portion of Jezreel, so that they shall not say, this is Jezebel. And so you see how the body of Jezebel was in bad shape, and that was the curse. But because she was a king's daughter, it was still granted her to have a burial. Let us also look at the case of the young prophet who made a mistake, did not listen to God, and took up the invitation of the old prophet, and we know what happened to him. Let's look at what happened. Let's read about this in 1 Kings chapter 13, starting at verse 23. And it came to pass after he had eaten bread and after he had drunk that he saddled for him the ass to wit for the prophet whom he had brought back. And when he was gone, a lion met him by the way and slew him and his carcass was cast in the way and the ass stood by it. The lion also stood by the carcass. And behold, man passed by and saw the carcass cast in the way and the lion standing by the carcass. And they came and told it in the city where the old prophet dwelt. And you can sense here, therefore, that there is a sense of dishonor where your carcass is just lying there in the wilderness, in the way. And there's even a lion standing by the carcass and everybody is seeing you. You are not out of sight, but everybody can see your corpse. And there is no veil upon the fact that time has expired for you and that you are no longer belonging under the sun. Being now unable to produce works that God would accept. And yet are you still exposed and not out of sight? This is a dishonor. And so at the end of verse 25, and they came and told it in the city where the old prophet dwelt. And so as we're going to find out, God had mercy on the young prophet and will orchestrate that he would still get a burial. Verse 26, and when the prophet that brought him back from the way heard thereof, he said, it is the man of God who was disobedient unto the word of the Lord. But nonetheless, he was a man of God. Therefore, the Lord hath delivered him unto the lion, which hath torn him and slain him according to the word of the Lord, which he spake unto him. And so like Jezebel, there is dishonor there in that the body has been torn. Verse 27, and he spake to his sons saying, saddle me the ass, and they saddled him. Verse 28, and he went and found his carcass cast in the way, and the ass and the lion standing by the carcass. The lion had not eaten the carcass, nor torn the ass. And the prophet took up the carcass of the man of God and laid it upon the ass and brought it back. And the old prophet came to the city to mourn and to bury him. And he laid his carcass in his own grave. And they mourned over him, saying, Alice, my brother. And so the young prophet still gets a burial in the end, but there was a period of time where he was exposed, where he was not out of sight, that is his carcass, as he was now the dead. But 
the Lord orchestrated that his honor would be restored and that at least as a man of God, he would get that burial and would be put out of sight. Very well. So now, brothers and sisters, let us also look at cases where men of God were laid to rest and there was a proper burial or a proper handling of their remains. We go to Genesis chapter 50. And Joseph fell upon his father's face and wept upon him and kissed him. And Joseph commanded his servants, the physicians, to embalm his father. And the physicians embalmed Israel. And so there was care taken for the body. Verse 3, and 40 days were fulfilled for him. For so are fulfilled the days of those which are embalmed. And the Egyptians mourned for him three score and ten days. Now, we may be tempted to say that this was just an Egyptian practice, but in Acts chapter 9 at verse 36, we see that Tabitha, by interpretation called Dorcas, this woman who perished, they washed her body and had laid it in an upper chamber. And so they also took care of the body of the deceased of the dead to keep it and preserve it in good shape. And this I mentioned to contrast what happened to Jezebel and to the young prophet whose bodies were mauled in essence or torn in essence. Acts chapter nine, verse 36. Now there was at Joppa, a certain disciple named Tabitha, which by interpretation is called Dorcas. This woman was full of good works and alms deeds, which she did. And it came to pass in those days that she was sick and died, whom when they had washed, they laid her in an upper chamber. Amen. And so getting back to Genesis chapter 50, where Joseph had his father Israel embalmed, we see that there is an honor granted to the dead to preserve their bodies in a decent state until the time that they are put away that they are buried out of sight. And there is also further mourning and weeping. All of that is biblical. We do mourn and weep for our dead. And now let us look at Exodus chapter 13, verse 19. And Moses took the bones of Joseph with him, for he had straightly sworn the children of Israel, saying, God will surely visit you, and ye shall carry up my bones away hands with you. And so there was a promise made that the bones of Joseph were going to be taken to a certain place. And so again, you see the idea of having respect about the remains of the man of God and of man in general when he doesn't appear to be suffering from a violent cursed death from a death that has some type of curse attached to it. We go to Joshua chapter 24, verse 32, and the bones of Joseph, which the children of Israel brought up out of Egypt, buried they in Shechem, in a parcel of grain which Jacob bought of the sons of Amor, the father of Shechem, for an hundred pieces of silver, and it became the inheritance of the children of Joseph. And so we see here that even money, financial resources, can be directed to the acquiring of the burying place, of a sepulcher, so that we can bury the dead out of sight. And so where some may say that not a dime should be spent concerning the dead, well, I see one of two things. Uh, either the dead will have specifically said that they want their body handled in a certain way, and we can respect that. Or, if we don't have such a specific instruction, we do not have to feel like we are being unbiblical for the sole reason that we are incurring cost to take care of the body of the deceased, the corpse. Now, of course, we know that according to the Bible, 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 23, all things should be done in good measure. All things are lawful for me but all things are not expedient. All things are lawful for me, but all things edify not. And so it is not because something is allowed or proper 
that we have to take it overboard and start doing things that are unnecessary, though it be within our power to do that. And so if I adapt this verse to the context, sure, we can incur costs to bury the dead, but if we become unreasonable about it and start spending, for instance, millions of dollars for a funeral, I personally believe that we go overboard. But that being said, as we're going to see, there were costs incurred by Abraham to bury the dead. Lastly, we're going to see, brothers and sisters, in Deuteronomy chapter 34, verses 5 and 6. So Moses, the servant of the Lord, died there in the land of Moab, according to the word of the Lord. So Moses died. And listen to this, verse 6. And he, that is the Lord, himself, buried him in a valley in the land of Moab, over against Beth Peor. But no man knoweth of his sepulcher unto this day. How magnificent is this, that the Lord himself conducted a burial concerning Moses, a quote-unquote great man of God. How is it that the Lord buried him himself? Thereby do we see that it is something that is proper to have a burial, as we read in Ecclesiastes earlier, I believe chapter 6, verse 3. And so a burial was in order, a proper burial was in order for Moses, and the Lord conducted it himself. Now this brings about another aspect, which is that when we put the dead out of our sight, yes, we take away that which has come to stink and needs to be out of sight because it has no longer a place under the sun, but we also want to avoid, I do believe that the Lord wants us to avoid, idolatry. You see, in Exodus chapter 20, verse 3, the Lord says, Thou shalt have no other gods before me. Now, do we not see in this world how a lot of cultures, a lot of nations turn to their ancestors and even preserve their corpses to then have them as the equivalent of what we would call statues? Or if they do not keep the body, the corpse, they will keep the ashes and then they will put this up upon some shrine, and such remains will become their gods. These remains become what the people turn to, to worship their ancestors. And so by putting the dead out of our sight, we also preserve ourselves from this, from such practices that are an abomination unto the Lord, who tells us not to speak to the dead, and tells us not to have other gods before me. And so your ancestors must not become gods in your eyes after that they have departed from under the sun because they have no longer anything to do, nor works to do, nor do they know anything about anything that is under the sun, as we have previously seen. Now, why do I mention this? Because we have just read that Moses had a private burial by the Lord himself having been a great man of God, quote unquote great, and having served the Lord in a very powerful way by the grace and mercy of the Lord himself. And so we made mention of this in Deuteronomy chapter 34, verses 5 and 6. God buried him in a valley in the land of Moab over against Beth Peor, but no man knoweth of his sepulcher unto this day. Some have speculated that the Lord wanted to avoid the remains of Moses becoming some object of cult, some object of worship, and that people would want to view his place of sepulcher as holy ground or something of the sort. And so the Lord wanted, according to that, a theory that Moses have a secret burial location, a secret burial place, a sepulcher, of which no man would know. Indeed, in Jude verse 9, we read, Yet Michael the archangel, when contending with the devil, he disputed about the body of Moses, durst not bring against him a railing accusation, but said, The Lord rebuke thee. And so the idea, still according to that speculation, would be that Satan would have tried to get a hold of the body of Moses to then put it back in the hands of the people so that they would worship him, Moses, his remains, 
rather than worship the Almighty God, who doesn't want any other person or God before him. But Michael the Archangel intervened to thwart that plan of Satan, according to that theory. Which, in my eyes, uh, is coherent and reasonable. But as we do not have clear scripture saying this, I'm only expressing my opinion. But nonetheless, we see that certainly the Lord orchestrated a proper burial for his servant Moses, as was the case for Abraham concerning Sarah. And so the general principle is indeed that we bury the dead and that we weep and mourn for them, even incurring cost if we have to do so, but in a reasonable manner. Unless, of course, perhaps the departed gave specific instructions regarding what should happen to their body in a way that costs less money. And therefore, it is not a matter of dishonoring this person, but rather respecting their last wishes. We are talking about a proper burial. We are talking about weeping for the dead and mourning for a time, but then getting back up and putting them out of our sight because they no longer have a role to play under the sun. And this despite the good times that we have experienced with them while they were among us during the time of their earthly pilgrimage. The different seasons, the different times on this earth as our life, which is but a vapor, unfolds. And a lifespan during which God now accepteth our works. Now, I also want to add concerning the idolatry of the dead. Let us look at a case scenario where that may arise. Look at 2 Kings chapter 13, verse 21. And it came to pass as they were burying a man that, behold, they spied a band of man, and they cast the man into the sepulcher of Elisha. And when the man was let down and touched the bones of Elisha, he revived and stood up on his feet. And so this was a great miracle. And Elisha was a man greatly used by God. And when we read this, this is where the idea may surface in the minds of some, that if you look for a man of God who was used in a powerful way, maybe his remains can have power. And this is where people could start looking for the sepulcher of Moses, thinking that if they touch such remains or such sepulcher or burial ground that something special may happen, that some miracle may occur. And so because God knows us and the way we sometimes think, he may have been looking to protect the people concerning Moses and the reputation that he has as having been a man greatly used by God so that people could have been inclined or tempted to look for his sepulcher and make it a place of worship or a place that they would expect to be a place where miracles could happen. In light, for instance, of such a passage here where Elisha, his bones, were involved in the occurring of a miracle. We are now going to have a look at the Gospel of Luke, chapter 9, verse 60. Jesus said unto him, let the dead bury their dead but go thou and preach the kingdom of God. And so this is about this man who was saying, Lord, let me first bury my father and then I will follow you. But Jesus told him, let the dead bury their dead. And some of you may think, well, Jesus is telling us here that burial is not important and that we should not invest time in burying the dead. Well, here is clarification concerning this verse because the Bible does not contradict itself. And so here there are two aspects that we have to expound. The first is that Jesus is talking in spiritual terms. When he says, let the dead bury their dead, of course, a corpse has no power to rise up and go and bury another person who is dead. And therefore, he's talking about the spiritually dead. And so Jesus is saying to this man, I want you to follow me. I want you to have spiritual life because there are people who are dead while living, 
meaning spiritually they're dead. They're alive in the flesh, but spiritually they don't have life because they don't have me. I am the life. And because they don't follow me, because they don't believe on me, they don't have life because the life is in the sun. And so those who don't follow Jesus are dead spiritually. And Jesus is here saying those people who are not following me, who are not spiritually alive, having found me and believed on me, they are spiritually dead. And let these people who do not have a calling to come after me, who do not have a calling to walk with me, let them take care of burying the corpses. But you, this man whom I am calling and speaking to, because I called you to follow me, I want you to come after me immediately. I want you to serve me immediately because I'm calling you to service. And so here we are in a case of exception where God is calling someone to serve him immediately and there is no time to waste and the person cannot tarry. And therefore, what happens is Jesus is telling this man, not even the burial of your father should be more important, should have preeminence, should have precedence over the call that I have put over your life to follow me. And so this is the first thing you must understand. There is a spiritual twist here where Jesus is saying, let those who are spiritually dead, whom I have no need of right now because they don't follow me, let them take care of the affairs of this life and going to bury the dead. You, you follow me and you follow me immediately and there should not be any hindrance not even the burial of your father, to you coming to me right now and serving me. Go thou and preach the kingdom of God. That's the first aspect. Jesus was speaking in terms of spiritual death and making a separation between those who are spiritually dead and those who are spiritually alive. The second point Jesus was making is as I started to mention in the first point, that there should be no competition between the call of God and any affairs of this life. And so the burial of your father is not an excuse for you to stop serving the Lord. And to look at that, we're going to go back to the passage where Ezekiel's wife has perished and died because God took her away from Ezekiel, his wife, the desire of his eyes. Let us get back to Ezekiel chapter 24. So you remember what happened to Ezekiel's wife. Verse 15, also the word of the Lord came unto me saying, son of man, behold, I take away from thee the desire of thine eyes with a stroke. Yet neither shalt thou mourn nor weep, neither shall thy tears run down. And so you see here, that the Lord is giving a clear instruction in this specific case to this specific prophet, to this specific man of God, that he should not be concerned with the death of his wife. And that is different from what happened to Abraham. And so here we have a case of exception where someone will get a clear command to not let a burial interfere with their calling. It was the case with that man that we spoke about in the Gospel of Luke chapter 9 verse 60, and it was again the case concerning Ezekiel. Let us keep reading. Verse 17, forbear to cry, make no mourning for the dead. Bind the tire of thine head upon thee, and put on thy shoes upon thy feet, and cover not thy lips, and eat not the bread of men. So I spake unto the people in the morning, and that even my wife died, and I did in the morning as I was commanded. So here Ezekiel is given a clear commandment by God himself to not mourn and weep for his wife, being warned that she was going to be taken from him, even the desire of his eyes. And so the passage in the Gospel of Luke, chapter 9, actually ties into this passage of Ezekiel to show you that in special circumstances, God will not want you to be concerned with worries and affairs of this life and let them interfere with the calling that he has put on your life. Remember the parable of the king 
who summons and bids his guests to the supper. Some say, I have a wife that I have just married and I must spend time with her. Some will say, I have just purchased an oxen and I must prove it. Some will say, I have a business that I must look after. And so we make up excuses with worldly things, things that pertain to the glory of this world, things that are earthly, affairs of this life, and some allow these things to interfere with the calling of God in their life. That is the equivalent of being bid to the supper of the king. And so here, Ezekiel has a task to do. He has to go and speak to the people as a prophet, as a man of God, as a servant who is being called, and he has to obey that. And he must not be concerned about his wife's death and invest himself in the same manner that Abraham did to experience this emotional response. And it is the same thing for the man in the Gospel of Luke, who was told to follow the Lord immediately and not be concerned and weeping about a burial. In essence, brothers and sisters, this is a principle that we have come to observe in the Gospel of Mark chapter 1, when the Lord called Simon and Andrew his brother, and also James and John the sons of Zebedee, Jesus told them to follow him, and they had to comply immediately, regardless of the earthly concerns that they may have had at that time. Mark chapter 1 verse 16. Now as he walked by the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and Andrew his brother casting a net into the sea for they were fishers, so they were busy. Verse 17, and Jesus said unto them, come ye after me, and I will make you to become fishers of men. And straightway, they forsook their nets and followed him. Verse 19, and when he had gone a little farther thence, he saw James the son of Zebedee and John his brother, who also were in the ship mending their nets. And straightway he called them. And they left their father Zebedee in the ship with the hired servants and went after him. You see, Simon and Andrew, they left their nets, their occupation. But here we go a step further. Not only did James and John leave their nets, but they also left family members, their father, and certainly friends in the hired servants, people they had a relationship with. And so you see the escalation here where God will have you relinquished things and relationships of this world to come and follow him immediately. And this in turn connects to how in the Gospel of Luke, this man is told, don't be concerned about burying your father right now. Come with me, follow me, go preach the kingdom. And also how he told Ezekiel not to weep and mourn for his wife. And so concerning the gospel of Luke, we have seen that the Lord was speaking in spiritual terms, saying that there are some who have not received him, who are spiritually dead. Let them deal with the affairs of this life. And you who I am calling, leave everything that you are doing and follow me immediately. And this is the case, the case of exception, where a burial will be set aside because it does not have preeminence over the affairs of the kingdom and of God who is calling you. But outside that case of exception, the general principle we have seen concerning Abraham, concerning Joseph and Moses, who were given proper burials, and in the case of Moses, by God himself. Amen? Alleluia. And we're going to go back to Genesis and see that Indeed, there were costs incurred even by Abraham in terms of making sure that the remains are taken care of. We saw also how Jezebel and the young prophet, their bodies were not out of sight. And it was a source of dishonor because they were even torn and not hidden. Whereas in the case of Tabitha Dorcas, her body was properly cared for, even washed and laid in the upper room prior to the burial. And in the case of Lazarus, he was put in a sepulcher. And so as the Bible teaches us to not have a proper burial, that is a source of dishonor. It is a form of a curse. And in the case of both the prophet and Jezebel, 
there was ultimately a burial in the case of Jezebel because she was a king's daughter and in the case of the young prophet because he was a man of God after all. And we saw how there can be idolatry concerning the remains of the man of God, which is why some speculate that God wanted to hide the body of Moses for that reason. And we read about how the bones of Elisha, case in point, because a miracle was operated concerning these bones, men may come to think that by seeking out bones of saints or men that were used greatly by God, that they may experience further miracles. And God who doesn't want anything between himself and us, even our ancestors and their remains, did clearly tell us to not have anything before his face. And knowing us is trying to preserve us from such practices that are occult to worship your ancestors. Now, to add unto the aspect of idolatry concerning men of God, let us go back to the story of the young prophet. We will see how the old prophet actually desired to be buried in the same sepulcher as the young prophet, because the old prophet recognized the authenticity of the calling of the young prophet and sought proximity with the young prophet, even in death. So let us look, we already read the beginning of that part in 1 Kings chapter 13. Let us move further down. So this is about the old prophet, verse 31. And it came to pass after he had buried him that he spake to his sons saying, and listen to this, when I am dead, then bury me in the sepulcher wherein the man of God is buried. Lay my bones beside his bones. And this is how men can have a mind to try to think that there is a blessing for them in getting close to a man of God or even his remains. Verse 32, for the saying which he cried by the word of the Lord against the altar in Bethel and against all the houses of the high places which are in the cities of Samaria shall surely come to pass. And so the old prophet recognized the authenticity of the young prophet and sought some type of honor in having his bones laid beside the bones of the young prophet. And there is a form of idolatry there. And I'm saying this to substantiate the speculation or hypothesis pertaining to the fact that the body of Moses is hidden, the sepulcher where it is laid and has been laid by the Lord himself who gave Moses a proper burial. The Lord himself did that. And so, brothers and sisters, we have said a lot of things. Let us go back to Genesis chapter 23, where it all started, and we're going to see how everything that we've explained is now much clearer as we read uh, this chapter. And Sarah was 107 and 20 years old. These were the years of the life of Sarah, her lifespan, during which she experienced many things, and there were different times and seasons in her life. And Sarah died in Kirjath Harba, the same as Hebron in the land of Canaan. And Abraham came to mourn for Sarah and to weep for her. And Abraham stood up from before his dead and spake unto the sons of Heth, saying, I am a stranger and a sojourner with you. Give me a possession of a burying place with you that I may bury my dead out of my sight. You know, in 2 Timothy chapter 2, it tells us that no soldier should be preoccupied with the affairs of this life so that he cannot serve properly he who hath called him to serve, and that is the Lord. And so this is why the man in the Gospel of Luke chapter 9, he had a calling to go and preach the kingdom. He could not be occupied with the burial of his father. And that's why Simon, Peter, and Andrew, they had to let go of their nets and follow the Lord. And that's why James and John, the sons of Zebedee, had to let go of their nets of their father and the hired servants and follow the Lord. Give me a possession of a burying place with you that I may bury my dead, no longer my wife, out of my sight. And it is interesting, as I read this, I'm also thinking about the fact that in the afterlife, we are no longer husband and wife. 
And so how proper is it now that he is no longer calling her his wife, but she has become the dead. And indeed, she is no longer his wife. Verse 5, And the children of Heth answered Abraham, saying unto him, Hear us, my lord, thou art a mighty prince among us. In the choice of our sepulchres bury thy dead. None of us shall withhold from thee his sepulchre, but that thou mayest bury thy dead. Do you see how many times this is mentioned? The need to bury the dead. The need to bury those who have departed because they no longer have a place under the sun and their works are no longer accepted. Brothers and sisters, this is you and I as well concerned with such a practice. We are here in our vanity, but there is a time appointed. It is appointed to man once to die and then the judgment. Now we know that on the day of the Lord, some will still be living, as Paul explains in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. But we're going along the general lines here that every man has a time appointed and we have a number of days given us, as we were discussing in the beginning of this video. Verse 7, And Abraham stood up and bowed himself to the people of the land, even to the children of Heth. And so there is recognition in the fact that they're going to help him honor the dead with a proper burial. And there is appreciation from Abraham that they are collaborating with him in this matter. Verse 8, And he communed with them, saying, If it be your mind that I should bury my dead out of my sight, hear me and entreat for me to Ephron, the son of Zohar, that he may give me the cave of Machpelah, which he hath, which is in the end of his field. For as much money as it is worth, he shall give it me for a possession of a burying place among you, amongst you. And so again, the notion of a burying place, and we see that there are costs incurred, and there is money that is going to be spent to enable, to allow for a proper burial. Verse 10, And Ephron dwelt among the children of Heth. And Ephron the Hittite answered Abraham in the audience of the children of Heth, even of all that went in at the gate of his city, saying, Nay, my lord, hear me. The field give I thee, and the cave that is therein I give it thee. In the presence of the sons of my people give I it thee. Bury thy dead. Bury thy dead. Verse 12, And Abraham bowed down himself before the people of the land. And he spake unto Ephron in the audience of the people of the land, saying, But if thou wilt give it, I pray thee, hear me. I will give thee money for the field. Take it of me, and I will bury my dead there. And Ephron answered Abraham, saying unto him, verse 15, My lord, hearken unto me. The land is worth four hundred shekels of silver. What is that betwixt me and thee? Bury therefore thy dead. And Abraham hearkened unto Ephron, and Abraham weighed to Ephron the silver, which he had named in the audience of the sons of Heth, 400 shekels of silver. Current money with the merchant. And the field of Ephron, which was in Machpelah, which was before Mamre, the field, and the cave which was therein, and all the trees that were in the field, that were in all the borders round about, were made sure unto Abraham for a possession in the presence of the children of Heth, before all that went in at the gate of his city. And so there was a burying place that was put in the possession of Abraham for the purpose of a proper burial for his dead, who used to be his wife. 
Verse 19, and after this, Abraham buried Sarah, his wife, in the cave of the field of Machpelah before Mamre. The same is Hebron in the land of Canaan. And so we remember that she was his wife, and now she is the dead, and she must be buried out of his sight. Abraham gave his wife Sarah a proper burial, as the Lord himself gave Moses a proper burial. And the field and the cave that is therein were made sure unto Abraham for a possession of a burying place by the sons of Heth. And so a burying place was purchased and there was a proper burial for Sarah, who knew different seasons in life and now had departed. Now, Abraham himself, also the time came that it was appointed for him to die as well. Genesis chapter 25, we are at verse seven. And these are the days of the years of Abraham's life, which he lived an hundred three score and 15 years. And so 175 years. Verse eight. Then Abraham gave up the ghost and died in a good old age, an old man and full of years, and was gathered to his people. And so there was a moment where people mourned and wept for him. And his sons Isaac and Ishmael buried him in the cave of Machpelah, buried him in the cave of Machpelah in the field of Ephron, the son of Sohar the Hittite, which is before Mamre. The field which Abraham purchased of the sons of Heth, there was Abraham buried and Sarah his wife. And so we see that as men, we do not escape death, Abraham, buried his wife and then he was buried himself and there was a proper burial and there were costs incurred but at one point abraham got up from before his dead and we have seen that in cases that are exceptional the lord may ask someone to stop what they're doing at a precise moment immediately and follow him in which case a proper burial is not going to be a hindrance to these people not because it is not proper to offer a proper burial, but because the Lord has a special calling upon a person's life where he is not allowing for anything in the affairs of this life to turn us away from the calling that is urgent and that he has decided becomes effective immediately. And so in circumstances where the Lord says, you must go and do something for me now and serve me immediately, we cannot turn around and say, we have to go and conduct a proper burial. Now again, as I've explained, that doesn't mean that the general principle is not to have a proper burial because we did read in Ecclesiastes that if a man doesn't have a proper burial, an untimely birth is better than he. And further, we saw in Deuteronomy that the Lord himself, he buried Moses in a valley in the land of Moab. So there you have it, brothers and sisters. This is what I wanted to share with you concerning Genesis chapter 23, and in particular, verse 4, that I may bury my dead out of my sight. And so we discussed at length about a proper burial, how it is indeed biblical, and that costs may be incurred, and that a burying place, a sepulcher, is important. It is something to honor those who have departed although we have to do it in a reasonable manner. And we have seen that a proper burial can be set aside or not allowed to become a hindrance to an immediate calling by the Lord to go and serve him. And we should not therefore in these specific circumstances allow for earthly concerns to turn us away from the Lord or become something more important than him because then it becomes idolatry. We have also seen how the remains, the bones of the dead, 
are not to be worshipped. Ancestors are not to be worshipped, nor should we attempt to contact them, but rather we should look to the Lord for all things. And some have speculated concerning this, that this is one of the reasons why the Lord hid the body of Moses and gave him a private funeral, a private burial, so that people would not make an idol of him or his remains an object of worship. And this considering the miracle that occurred concerning the bones of Elisha. We also discussed how the body, the remains, if they are torn, it is a form of dishonor and may be the result of a curse. And to that end, we have examined the story of the young prophet and Jezebel, though they were given a proper burial ultimately. And we looked at Tabitha Dorcas, whose body was preserved, and it was the case as well for Israel, who was embalmed by Joseph. And we saw that Joseph's bones were carried and that the remains were taken care of. And so, brothers and sisters, we come away understanding that a proper burial is in order, but that we must not go overboard. We must also take into account the will of the deceased and that there is a separation between the living and the dead because under the sun, the dead have no longer their passions alive there to do any works or the possibility of exercising any power under the sun. And so the lifespan that was given them, the time that was appointed them has expired. We have seen that during our life, we have great experiences with our loved ones, but a time comes when they are departed that we want to put them out of our sight because now they stink, because now we get up from our weeping and mourning and we must continue the walk. We must continue to run and serve the almighty God. And there is nothing that can be a hindrance to obeying the Lord. May you be blessed, brothers and sisters, in the mighty name of Yehoshua HaMashiach, Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Hallelujah. Amen.